it's an honor for me to stand here and welcome you tonight because all of you are the ones that put the community into a community read. And uh, every year, our community read just creates the most amazing connections. Um, this one especially because there were so many local aspects to Paul Harding's book. Um, for example, one of our faithful library volunteers just told me that she had had two clocks fixed by Mr. Crosby, who's in the book, and she remembered him really well. Someone else knew Mr. Crosby when he was a teacher at Beverly High School. Still another told me that Paul Harding was practically born on her doorstep. <laughs> I spoke with another patron who shared how she cried at the end of Tinker's because she was just so moved by the book's beautiful language. And it's really happy for me to see all the connections that are being made this evening. The writer Henry James wrote the following words to his nephew. Three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. And I've seen so many acts of kindness that made this evening possible. I especially would like to thank all the creative and dedicated staff members, trustees, friends, and volunteers of the Hamilton Wenham, Beverly, and Manchester by the Sea libraries who've made this night possible. I also thank the staff, faculty, and students of Gordon College who've been so generous and gracious to host our fifth community read event. And finally, I thank you, Paul Harding. He has been on a whirlwind of a schedule since he won the Pulitzer Prize, and his kindness in being here tonight is extraordinary. So thank you all and welcome. Thank you, Jan. Well, I'm delighted to introduce and to actually welcome back Paul Harding to Wenham. Uh, before he became an award-winning novelist, Paul Harding was a drummer in the rock band Coldwater Flat. He once said, our reputation in Boston was that we sounded like the who. Uh, he also said, to me, it's just circumstantial whether I pick up a pair of drumsticks or whether I open a laptop. I feel like I'm a transmitter or something like that. What comes through, I start tapping out on the drum set or tapping out on the keyboard. Well, we know now that that tapping has reverberated throughout the literary world. Tinker's had an initial run of only 3,500 copies and earned Paul an advance of $1,000. The remarkable success that has followed that release of the book came about in what's often been called an old-fashioned way. There was no media blitz or book tours. People who loved the novel simply told others about it. There wasn't social media, says Michael Coffey, co-editor of Publishers Weekly. It was real word of mouth and somebody picking up the lunch check. Raised in Wenham, Paul went fly fishing in northern Maine during the summers and apprenticed with his grandfather in repairing clocks. He completed his undergraduate degree at UMass Amherst and then also graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop. He enjoys reading 19th century fiction, theology like Karl Barth, and physics. Today he lives in Georgetown with his wife and two sons. He remarks, I write what I would call lyrical prose. It comes from being a drummer. It comes from thinking about cadence and rhythm and moving to different time signatures. So to give us a little more opportunity to hear about the cadences of time, memory, and imagination in fiction, I'm very pleased to introduce to you the most recent winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Paul Harding. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you kindly, this is, I feel like I, could not possibly be equal to how wonderful um, uh, this 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 event this event is. Um, I first just want to start by thanking the libraries, the Hamilton Wenham Library, the Beverly Library, the Manchester Library, everybody who particip participated in the community reads program. It just fills my heart with joy, and I especially want to thank um, Gordon College for for hosting this. This is a beautiful room, and I, I really feel very strongly that um, 
uh, art, which is what I aspire, uh, what I aspire to, um, is basically an act of fellowship, you know, and that, and that us coming together um, for events like this is what I think of the, uh, s somewhere along the lines of what I think of the theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer um, means when he talks about um, sharing a word of recognition among friends. I think recognition is also one of the hallmarks of art. So, so um, what I thought I would do is um, talk to you for a little bit just about the, the, uh, the genesis of Tinker's and some of its worldly career, um, and then maybe read a couple of brief passages from the book. Um, and, then, and then get to the part of the night that is my favorite part um, anyways, which is the Q&A. And I figure that since this is kind of part of a community reads um, program that um, we could just have like a big old book group meeting if you don't, if you don't, if you don't mind. So, um, so the, the way that Tinkers came about was, it's true, when I, I first became a writer, um, when I was uh, on break from being a, uh, from, from touring with a rock band that I was in called Coldwater Flat, and we toured all around Europe and North America and played ear-splittingly loud rock music. Um, and um, and um, when, when, the, when, the, when the band um, sort of went up in flames, as rock bands tend to, um, I, I had some time off, and um, I had always been, I had never been a writer, but I always thought of myself as a writer. I thought of myself as a writer for many years before I actually wrote, which I think is common to a lot of writers. Um, but I'd always been an avid reader, and I think like a lot of readers, um, there was a certain point where I delighted so much in what, my favorite books did to my mind when I read them, the way that a good book opens your mind up. I was so, so delighted by that and so delighted by the effect. My very favorite effect as a reader um, is, are those moments when you're, when you're reading a book and you read a passage and you simultaneously recognize that what you have just read is true that what you have just read, um, you have always known is true, and that you have also never seen another person put that into words before. And so my motivation for being a writer was simply to reproduce those types of moments for my own readers and for my own self in the process of, in the process of writing. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the Iowa Writers Workshop, where I was fortunate enough to study with Marilyn Robinson, the novelist Marilyn Robinson. Um, but while I was in Iowa, um, I didn't work on Tinkers. I worked on a novel that was about a 12-year-old girl who disguises herself as a boy so that she can work in a silver mine in colonial Mexico. Um, and so as you can imagine, um, there was a lot of research. In fact, there was so much research that I had to do for that book um, that it got so I couldn't write a sentence without spending a week in the library. It was, you know, sort of... Um, you know, would the German mining engineer have buckles on his shoes? And it just, it's a, and so um, due to my own limitations and the, and the complexity of the, of, of the project, I, I could never get the thing um, to go anywhere beyond uh, just sort of costume drama, a sort of melodramatic costume drama. So almost, almost to the day that I left the workshop, the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, I went back to Tinkers, which had originally started off as a, as a short story, and I began to work on that. Now, I have to say that my, at first, the very mundane motive for going back to Tinkers was that since it was based on family stories and since it, it was mostly set in Wenham and also in northern Maine, um, parts of northern Maine with which I was familiar, um, it, it had the very attractive quality of, um, uh, of, um, of me having to do absolutely no research whatsoever. Whatsoever. So it's slightly a little bit of a lazy motive there for that. But um, all of the dramatic premises of Tinker's are based on um, family stories that my maternal grandfather um, told me about um, his childhood in, in nor growing up in northern Maine. So as in the book, um, his father was a tinker. He wasn't, he wasn't a tinker proper. He was what was called a fuller brush salesman. So he was an itinerant, um, itiner an itinerant salesman. And like the character Howard Crosby in Tinkers, um, he had epilepsy and um, left, abandoned my grandfather's family when my grandfather was 12 um, because he found out about his wife's plans to have him committed to an asylum. Um, also, like the book, um, my grandfather, whose name was Paul Washington Crosby, that was quite a leap from Paul Washington to George Washington, but, um, <laughs> um, uh, but, but like the character, he, um, 
he uh, was a repa- repaired and traded antique clocks, and he did so in, in Wenham, on Perkins Street in Wenham for many years. And I, while I, was a, um, while I was a broke musician, he took pity on me and allowed me to apprentice with him. So that's how I know um, about, what's, uh, about all the different things in the book about, about antique clocks. Um, so I worked on Tinkers after graduate school. Um, after I got out of graduate school, I was fortunate enough to um, receive a fellowship to a place in Provincetown, Massachusetts called the Fine Arts Work Center, which is wonderful. Um, and I think it's the only place in the country that has a program like this. But um, if you get a fellowship there, they give you a little sort of tackle shed cabin on the beach um, for seven months, and they pay you a monthly stipend, and you are just free to do whatever you like, um, preferably art. Um, um, and so I, I worked on Tinkers there for the, for, for the seven months I was there and probably finished um, half of a first draft, after which I began teaching full-time at um, Harvard, um, d- uh, teaching for Harvard's expository writing program, which is their, their version of um, freshman composition. So that was um, hard work for short money, I can assure you. Um, and... and um, and um, at the same time, I taught uh, at, um, in the Harvard Extension School at night, um, t- um, r- um, teaching fiction, fiction writing classes. And at the same time, my wife and I are starting a family, so we had our two sons who are both here tonight. Um, and so in my spare time, between all of that business, I, I wrote Tinkers. Um, actually, one, an anecdote I like to tell is that when our, our first son was a very, very young boy, maybe two years old, he had chronic ear infections. Um, and he, 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 nobody would get, get any sleep at night. And the only way we could get any sleep is um, during the day, we'd put him in, in the car, in his car seat, and drive him around. We lived in Beverly at the time. Drive him around Beverly, and the moment he would fall asleep, I'd pull over into Lynch Park or the Dane Street Beach parking lot, and I'd work on tinkers with, you know, on, on any scrap of paper that was around. And, um, and so in that way, over the course of three or four years, I, I amassed a manuscript. Um, the way that I write, I have to say, is very, very haphazard. The analogy that I use is I'm kind of, the, the way that I write is sort of like those little robot vacuum cleaners, you know, that you flick them on and they just kind of bounce around the room in a random way and they, and, you know, eventually they sort of, they vacuum the whole floor. And so that, that's how I wrote Tinkers because from the beginning, Tinkers, Tinkers is not, for those of you who have looked at it, you know that it's not based on plot. It's, um, it's, <laughs> it's very, in fact, I think all the, all the plot is, con- is, is contained in the first sentence and then from there it's um so it's very associative it's 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 meant to um it's meant to be a sort of poetic representation of the way a mind works and so when we think or when we um when we use our memory when we 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 call memories our our minds move around in time and move associatively and emotional emotionally rather than logically or in terms of plot that kind of linear way that a lot of novels work is something that we impose, I think, subsequently to the thought. So I just wrote, I wrote the book in the way that the character, the, 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 the protagonist thinks the book, as it were, um, which made for, when it came time to assemble the manuscript, a, just a big giant mess, basically. And, I, and the, the, the way that I came to actually end up putting the manuscript together was because a, a, after graduate school, I kept in touch with one of my teachers, a wonderful English novelist named Barry Unsworth. Um, and uh, he and I exchanged emails, and I saw him whenever he came back. He lives in Italy. Um, and e- every time we exchanged correspondence, I, I said, oh, I would mention, oh, I'm still working on this novel and this and that. And finally, after four years, he said to me, um, Paul, I should someday like to see this novel with which you keep threatening me. Um, so I thought, well, it's, t- it's time to sort of um, to put up, as it were. So I, I, printed the, I printed the manuscript up, and um, it, was, it was so haphazard that what I had to do was take scissors and tape and staples, and I cut the entire manuscript into all of its different little pieces, and then spread it out all across the, the, the floor of my living room. And I spent basically a weekend moving all the different pieces around um, in, in the manuscript in order, to, um, in, in, in order to sort of pull together a coherent arc to the story. Some people think that I never succeeded. But um, <laughs> we can talk about that later as long as your criticism is constructive. Um, but... Um, but, but nevertheless, I was relieved to find what I thought was, a, was, a, was actually a, 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 viable, a viable novel. Um, 
And uh, so I sent it to Barry. We received a very encouraging letter back from him. Um, and I figured, well, you know, I'm a big shot uh, graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, so what I'll do is I'll send the manuscript out, and I will, um, I will uh, collect all the offers together and weigh them and ch take, ch accept the best offer. Um, so um, I, I, then I, 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 I received um, a unanimous rejection um, that had the one virtue of being prompt, um, and and um, and, um, and and so I, I. But one of the things one of the things is that I, I was the rejection letters that I received. I didn't. I, I couldn't. I didn't take them personally because they described books that I would have no interest in writing. They just. They. Um, some of the criticisms I, I got were along the lines of nobody wants to read a book that has more than one point of view. Um, nobody wants to read a book that's this quiet and meditative and gentle, actually. And I, you know, I just think, well, there's enough violent books, so you know, gentleness is a virtue. Um, so personally, it was very difficult to get that sort of rejection, but objectively, when I sort of stepped back and was able to be philosophical about it in between the tears, I, um, I, I, um, I thought, well, you know, it's tough, it's a t it's tough being an artist. You know, it's, it's tough for writers to get their stories and their novels published. It's tough, tough for actors to um, find roles. It's tough for painters to find space in art galleries. So I sort of just felt like, you know, okay, so this is, this is my sort of fair share of the artist's, the artist's tough lot. So I, I put the book away and it sat in a desk drawer for four years and I was busy teaching and, and raising, raising children and, um, and, um, and all of that business. And then, and then, and then four years later, um, I was, um, talking with a poet, a friend of mine who's a poet, and we were sort of lamenting how difficult it is to get published. And he said, well, you know, I have a friend in, in New York City who um, runs a very small independent press, and why don't you query him, and you can um, drop my name and, and see what he says. So I, 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 I took him up on the offer. The, um, the, the publisher was a very gracious guy. He read the book, um, sent an e email back to me a, a couple of weeks later, saying, I absolutely love Tinkers, and I'm not going to publish it. And I thought, here we go again. Um, but he said, tomorrow night I just happened to be having um, uh, uh, dinner with a woman named Erica Goldman, who is the editor and publisher of a newly formed, not-for-profit press that is being run out of the infamous Bellevue Hospital um, <laughs> at the NYU School of Medicine. And so, of course, I said, Eureka, it's finally the perfect, the perfect fit. Um, and would you mind if I would you mind if I if I sent the manuscript along? And, I, and at that point, I really had, had 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 reconciled myself to not being published, and actually had to fight making that the chief reason and virtue for why I was a good writer. I'm a good writer, and I can prove it. I have un, you know all, all my stuff is under my bed. But um, <laughs> but at, but at, but at that point, I figured it would you know if we could just get 50 copies of the book in between two covers, I could give 45 of them to my mother and. <laughs> And, um, and, then, and then when I was in the band, I, you know, we'd put out CDs so I could sort of put the book with the CDs and say to my kids, Daddy wrote a book too, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I figured that that's, that's great. Um, so, the, so the book came out. They published 3,500 paperback copies. I, uh, as as um, was mentioned, I um, received the princely advance of $1,000 with which I promptly paid half the, that month's mortgage. And... Um, and, 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 and the book came out, the book, and, and, and Bellevue Press is so small that they really had no publicity budget, no marketing budget. So from the very beginning um, of the book's worldly career, um, getting it sort of out to, um, to, to out, out into the world consisted of um, hand selling the thing, just doing it all grassroots, hand sold, and from the beginning it was all independent booksellers and libraries that really, really um, took it under their wing. So there were um, independent bookstores all across the country, particularly beginning in San Francisco, um, and sort of following me back east from a first book tour I did there. And then the ALA um, really helped out. There's a woman named Nancy Pearl, who is um, sort of the patron saint of librarians. And she, she liked the book, and, so, and, and she helped out with that. Um, and so it was, it was um, and then one of, the, one of the most satisfying things about the, about that, about the first, 
first, say, chapter in the book's career, was um, an- another thing I would do is whenever I did readings, at the end, when people would come up and ask me to sign their books and say, oh, I'm going to get my book group to read this, I would say, if you do, I'll come to your house the night you discuss the book, and we'll talk about the book. So I kind of think this is just a bigger version of that. And so I went and I you know, ate a lot of questionable casseroles and drank a lot of Zinfandel and, and talked about... <laughs> But it was, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a sort of process and an act of fellowship. And it was just really quite a lovely experience to be able to go from, you know, into people, be invited into people's homes and to talk about lovely things like art and beauty and, and all these sorts of things and plenty of sort of per, people who were perplexed by the book itself. So, so it was, it, it, it had already had a lovely, a lovely, um, a lovely run. Um, and then it came to pass that I was teaching at the Iowa Writers Workshop last, last spring. Um, and on, I think, Monday, April 12th, I think it was, I knew that they were going to be announcing the Pulitzer Prizes. Um, and the way they do that is they just post the winners. Uh, they don't make any, they don't announce the finalists ahead of time. Um, they just post the winners on their website. And I knew they were going to be doing that at three in the afternoon, and I had to teach at four. So I thought, this is kind of my milieu. I'll check in. Certainly, I've probably heard of the author. Maybe I even know the author. And, um, and I, so I can go armed, armed to the class with that information, and we can just sort of, we can, we can, we can parse it in class, in seminar. And so I, 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 op- I logged on to the Pulitzer website, and there was Tinkers by Paul Harding. And I said, no, I'm not looking for Tinkers by Paul Harding. I'm looking for the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> And, and, and so I refreshed the page, and there was Tinkers by Paul Harding again, and I sort of hit the computer and sort of <laughs> banged it and sort of said, what, what is this? And then, and, then, and then it struck me that this, in, case, this, this in fact, um, was not a cruel, practical joke, although sometimes I still think that one of my, you know, that sort of, one, of, one, of the, one of the things I tell people is that my disbelief, I, I still, my disbelief has not lessened at all. I'm just becoming habituated to my disbelief. So, so it struck me that I had won the Pulitzer Prize. And, and it was, it was the, the closest way I can describe it is it's like out of a cartoon. You know, my eyes sort of just jumped out of my head and my brain went inside out. And I really, it was sort of like a waking blackout because I couldn't, I, you know, it was the first time in my life I literally could not believe my eyes. There were the facts staring me in the face and I still just, just could not. So I sort of slid off the couch and was just, you know, trying, trying, to, um, trying to process it. And within a minute I was on the phone giving an interview um, to the Associated Press, um, who, which asked me for a quote which I, I think to this day was something like, you know, and that was so. Um, and, and, and so, I, and, 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 but the nice thing about it is that because it was published by such a small press and because it was all independent booksellers and libraries and all of the folks who sort of keep art and keep literature sort of vibrant and alive, um, it's easy for me to come and do these sorts, of, these sorts of events because I just feel like I get to be an ambassador for a group of people, all of whom can lay fair claim to a share in the prize. You know, I think it's heartening. Um, I think a lot of authors get discouraged and they think that these prizes are on lockdown and that if you get published independently or even self-published um, that you're, you sort of don't have a voice at the table or you, your hat's not in the ring or whatever metaphors you want to mix. Um, and so it's just, it's, just, it's just very lovely and, um, and, and it's allowed me to aspire to levels of humility that I never thought I would have to have to uh, try to attain so and and the book and, and, and winning the Pulitzer Prize for my f- first book is sort of I mean some days I just think well it's all downhill from here what am I gonna what am I gonna do um, but what I've just what I've finally realized is that the sort of the, the Pulitzer is that to which I will spend my the rest of my life as a writer attempting to be equal so that brings us to being here today and being on this wonderful book tour. And, um, so I think what I'd like to do maybe is just read for 10 minutes just to give you a sense of some of the pros in the book. Um, and, then, um, and then I'd be delighted to just take, to take questions and, as I said, creative, um, uh, constructive criticism. So um, I, I don't think that this needs um, any, any introduction. I'm just going to read a couple of things about, the, um, ab- about Howard Crosby, the, the, the title character, and then we can, we can talk. So, Howard Aaron Crosby drove a wagon for his living. It was a wooden wagon. 
It was a chest of drawers mounted on two axles and wooden spoked wheels. There were dozens of drawers, each fitted with a recessed brass ring pulled open with a hooked forefinger that contained brush, brushes and wood oil, tooth powder and woolen stockings, shaving soap and straight edge razors. There were drawers with shoe shine and boot strings, broom handles and mop heads. There was a secret drawer where he kept four bottles of whiskey. Mostly back roads were his route. Dirt tracks that ran into the deep woods to hidden clearings where a log cabin sat among sawdust and tree stumps and a woman in a plain dress and hair pulled back so tight that she looked as if she were smiling, which she was not, stood in a crooked doorway with a cocked squirrel gun. Oh, it's you, Howard. Well, I guess I need one of your tin buckets. In the summer, he sniffed Heather and sang, I'll see you in my dreams, and watched the monarch butterflies up from Mexico. Spring and fall were his most prosperous times. Fall because the backwoods people stocked up for the winter. He piled goods from the cart onto blazing maple leaves. Spring because they had been out of supplies often for weeks before the roads were passable for his first rounds. Then they came to the wagon like sleepwalkers, bright-eyed and ravenous. Sometimes he came out of the woods with orders for coffins, a child, a wife, wrapped up in burlap and stiff in the woodshed. He tinkered, tin pots, wrought iron, solder melted and cupped in a clay dam, quicksilver patchwork. Occasionally, a pot hammered back flat, the tinkle of tin sibilant, tiny beneath the lid of the boreal forest. Tinkerbird, coppersmith, but mostly a brush and mop drummer. Tinker, tin, tin tinabulation. There was the ring of pots and buckets. There was also the ring in Howard Crosby's ears, a ring that began at a distance and came closer until it sat in his ears and then burrowed into them. His head thrummed as if it were a clapper in a bell. Cold hopped onto the tips of his toes and rode on the ripples of the ringing throughout his body until his teeth clattered and his knees faltered and he had to hug himself to keep from unraveling. This was his aura, a cold halo of chemical electricity that encircled him immediately before he was struck by a full seizure. Howard had epilepsy. His wife, Kathleen, formerly Kathleen Black of the Quebec Blacks, but from a reduced and stern branch of the family, cleared aside chairs and tables and led him to the middle of the kitchen floor. She wrapped a stick of pine in a napkin for him to bite so he would not swallow or chew off his tongue. Now, you can't actually swallow your tongue, but that was a common folk belief. If the fit came fast, she crammed the bare stick between his teeth and he would wake to a mouthful of splintered wood and the taste of sap, his head feeling like a glass jar full of old keys and rusty screws. What is it like to be full of lightning? What is it like to be split open from the inside by lightning? Howard used to imagine that it was like the rupture of a fit. Although he never remembered them, he had the sense that although there was cold before and chills after, during his seizures, his blood actually boiled and his brain nearly fried in its skull pan. It was as if there were a secret door that opened on its own to an electric storm spinning somewhere out on the fringes of the solar system. He imagined the door. Closed, it was invisible, cloaked in the colors of the world. Open, it was made of thick, plain oak and swung outward. It had a wooden knob because the electricity on the other side would erupt from a metal handle. Howard often wondered if there was a knob on the outside of the door. In his mind, he could not see if there was because the door was either closed and hidden or flung open so that the front, the side, painted in light and shadow, grass and water, faced the opposite direction. <clears throat> the, door, the open doorway framed an unbounded darkness. There was the black of the universe surrounding a pinwheel of light. Needles of electricity forked out of the whirlpool of sparks. Most of this lightning flashed and was gone in an instant, but when one of the charges found its way through the door and into Howard, it stuck fast. It latched onto something inside of him and held and held. 
In the cold, blasted hours following a seizure, confusion prevailed. Howard's blistered brain crackled and sparked blue behind his eyes, and he sat slumped, slack-jawed, blanket-wrapped, baffled by his diet of lightning. It was as if some well-intending being desired to give him a special gift and spoon-fed him the voltage from behind the door. No, not being even. There was the door, or maybe the doors, or maybe not even doors, just the curtains and the murals of this world, and the star-gushing universe was usually obscured by them. And Howard, by accident of birth, tasted the raw stuff of the cosmos. Other, larger, inhuman souls might very well thrive on such a feast. Howard thought angels, But the image he had of the seraphim with their long blonde curls and flowing white robes and golden halos did not fit with the more frightening, dark, powerful species he conjured, which would gorge on and delight in what, when ingested by him, instead of sating, instantly burst the seams of his thin body. The aura, the sparkle and tingle of an oncoming fit, was not the lightning. It was the cooked air that the lightning pushed in front of itself. The actual seizure was when the bolt touched flesh and in an instant so atomic, so nearly immaterial, nearly incorporeal, that there was almost no before and after, no cause A that led to effect B, but instead simply A, simply B, with no then in between, and Howard became pure unconscious energy. It was like the opposite of death, or a bit of the same thing death was, but from a different direction. Instead of being emptied or extinguished to the point of unselfness, Howard was overfilled, overwhelmed to the same state. If death was to fall below some human boundary, so his seizures were to be rocketed beyond it. Perhaps, Howard thought, the curtains and murals and pastel angels are a mercy, a dim reflection of things fit for the frailty of human beings. Whenever he looked at the angels in the family Bible, though, he saw their radiant golden halos and resplendent white robes, and he shook with fear. So maybe just to clear your palate a little bit of that heavy bit, I'll read you one last little bit. The stubbornness of some of the country women with whom Howard came into contact on his daily rounds cultivated in him, he believed, or would have believed had he ever consciously thought about the matter, an unshakable reasoning patience. When the soap company discontinued its old detergent for a new formula and changed the design on the box the soap came in, Howard had to endure debates he would have quickly conceded were his adversaries not paying customers. Where's the soap? This is the soap. The box is different. Yes, they changed it. What was wrong with the old box? Nothing. Why'd they change it? Because the soap is better. The soap is different. It's better. Nothing wrong with the old soap. Of course not, but this is better. Nothing wrong with the old soap. How can it be better? Well, it cleans better. Cleaned fine before. This cleans better and faster. Well, I'll just take a box of the normal soap. This is the normal soap now. I guarantee it. I can't get my normal soap. This is the normal soap. Well, I don't like to try a new soap. It's not new. Just as you say, Mr. Crosby, just as you say. Well, ma'am, I need another penny. Another penny for what? The soap is a penny more now that it's better. I have to pay a penny more for different soap in a blue box. I'll just take a box of my normal soap. So, thank you. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Kondo. So, so now I'd be delighted to take questions if anybody has any, anything there. Yeah, I see. Uh, there is a part of him that some of us know, the auctioneer, the man who sang, they sang Yinka Do Do at his funeral. Uh, he was in the barbershop quartet. He, that part of him is not in the book, and I wondered if that's because that was not real part of your life, or it just didn't fit the book. 
I think it's the latter. It, it didn't fit the book. There are, it's, it's funny because, all, as I said earlier, the, all, all of the dramatic premises of Tinker's are based um, on fact. They're based on the stories that my grandfather told me about his childhood in northern Maine. Um, but he, he wouldn't elaborate on those stories much. Um, and I've come to think that it's out of a combination of just sort of personal trauma and what I think of as kind of generational tact. Both he and my grandmother sort of had the, feel, had the attitude that we had tough lives, we made it out of the woods, we made prosperous lives for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren here in Wenham, and um, we're just not going to talk about the bad stuff, we're going to talk about just the, the positive stuff, which of course made those stories all the more irresistible to me. Um, but, um, but from the beginning, um, so e- even though all the premises of the, of the novel are based on fact, I really it would be difficult for me to be less interested in writing memoir or autobiography or biography in the case of my grandfather. And part of that also has to do that when I start thinking of my, my, my own life and my own family um, in non-fictional terms, um, I lose objectivity. I lose the ability to give things relative weight. Um, everything is of the utmost importance to me because it's my family. Um, so when I step back and sort of um, think of things in terms of fiction, I, um, it's, it's easier for me to, 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 to shape the story. I also, at, at the beginning, was more interested in the very first part of Tinker's that I wrote was the instant, if you've looked at the book, it's almost, I think, in, in the very middle of the book. It's just the instant that Howard Crosby, the Tinker, has, pa- has b- passed his family's, his house, um, with, his, with his wagon and his mule um, and realizes that what that means is that he has just left his family and that he's not going to turn back around because that seemed to be just the center sort of devastating fact of the story that, um, that I just wanted to, that I wanted to imagine. Um, so I just wrote, a, I, ima- I imagined a fictional versions of these people and of their lives until the imagined versions sort of hit their own critical mass, hit their own momentum, achieved their own integrity, and I wrote from, wrote from there. So. I could never do my grandfather justice, you know. It's... Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, I think we have two, two going on at once here. So uh, we'll get you, you, you do next, okay? Yeah. I think I read someplace that um, in another book, you're using some of your characters in this book in a second book. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm working on a second novel that's called Enon, which, as most of you know, is the original name of Wenham. So I'm really straying far for the next. Um, and the, and the, the, the book is about... Um, one of George Crosby's grandsons. Imagine, um, I think it's Charlie. It's Charlie in the book, but I sort of, re- you know, I, I mean, I finished tink- writing Tinkers five years ago, so I forget what's in it, actually. But um, it's about one of his grandsons and his grandson's daughter, Kate, and it, 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 it exclusively takes place in, in Wenham. So it's not a sequel per se, but it's the same setting, the same milieu, the same landscape, the same kind of familial DNA. So, yeah. Sir, did you? Uh, there were a couple of strong neg- negative uh, passages, oh, excuse me, negative passages about Howard's first wife, Kathleen, mm-hmm. in the book. Yeah. Uh, did you did you hear? I mean, hear anything redeeming about Kathleen in your in actual life or? Did you perceive that in the book in some fashion that she was to have some redeeming qualities? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, Kathleen, she's a tough nut to crack. Um, she's an embittered person. She's, she's, she's shocked by the, the turn her life has taken. Um, and I think she's, she's somebody who she's faced with, she, she's faced with what is a, an impossibly difficult set of circumstances and with very few resources um, with which to respond to those circumstances. Um, so I do think that she is, she's embittered. She you know, is, is very, very loosely based on what I knew of my great-grandmother, um, who by reputation was kind of a ferocious, miserable person. But I knew so little about her, I just knew, knew those were the basic facts. I knew also that, again, it was a kind of non-negotiable fact that she was the person who was going to be who was intending to have her husband sent to 
an asylum for his epilepsy. So she, she, she was a difficult person to write about. But I do think that she has redeeming factors. I think she's loyal to her children. And I think that um, even, I mean, I, 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 you know, here's a spoiler alert, but I mean, I, I think even that the way that Howard ends up escaping is somehow is abetted by her. I think that's kind of, a, that is, it's as modest as it is, it's a gesture of love. You know, it's, 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 it's modest. It's, it almost, you know, doesn't look like love, but to me it's sort of, it has the, 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 the kernel of love in it. So, yeah, but she was, t- in fact, I, I, I had maybe 50 or 60 pages all about her and her life before she met Howard. I, I had a whole section of the novel about her. And um, the problem was that every time she came on stage, the rest of the novel kind of started wobbling off of its access. And so for that, re- that very practical reason, I realized that the novel was just about the fathers and the sons. Um, so I had to sort of take her out of Tinker's. But I felt so loyal to her, and I felt, I mean, I think I feel so loyal to her precisely because she's the one that I just, I felt like I couldn't quite do justice to. Um, I tried to write a novella or a long short story about her, and I couldn't do that either. And part of it is because she's embittered as a character, just technically speaking, she is monotonous. You know, people who are embittered are monotone. They just strike the same chord over and over again. So in an effort to try to find different textures and... Um, and, um, and, and, and different ways to write about her that wouldn't be monotonous in themselves, I just found myself resorting to satire, and I didn't want to belittle her, so I felt like the best thing I could do was to let her live in obscurity, you know? She's the, sort of the one that got away. So, any other questions? Yeah. You said that as a drummer, you focused on the rhythm and cadence in your novel, and that you described it as a poetic novel on the mind. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how poetry informed your writing of the novel, and where exactly you would draw the line in between poetry and the novel as an art form. Okay, great. Um, Yeah, I mean, I do, I basically think of most of the writing in Tinker's as unlineated poetry. Um, it's, I think of it as lyric prose, or it's what's just on the other side of prose poetry. Um, it's sort of my, it's not really a mission, I wouldn't say, but I, I mean, I like the idea of drawing no lines between poetry and prose. I think most of those lines are theoretical, and they're artificial distinctions. Um, I mean, I ran into this a lot in graduate school because I was in the fiction writing program, but I was writing stuff that was like Tinker's. Um, and, you know, I just remember sort of getting dismayed responses, you know, people saying, this isn't, this isn't realistic. This is like poetry. And I said, yeah, it is. That's right. You're, that's an accurate description. But um, so it's, it's hard to kind of, and I think sometimes even, you know, the book is sold as a novel. And I think a lot of sort of poor hapless people, you know, sort of st- open it up and start reading. I think, what the heck is this? Um, <laughs> But, but hopefully, but the ideal that I shoot for as an artist, you know, trying to write is that, is that one of the hallmarks of, of uh, real works of art is that you can't paraphrase them. That you can't, you can't, um, it's like, you know, if you go see a movie and you love it so much and you're trying to describe it to a friend and you say, oh, and then there's this guy and he goes over here and it's really cool. And then you finally just say, oh, you just have to go see the movie. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experience that cannot be paraphrased. It has to be, you have to go to the thing itself. And that's what I want the book, the book to be. I also think that um, one of the hallmarks of great, good works of art, um, serious works of art, um, is uh, that, they, that they're sort of, um, every good work of art is a genre unto itself. It's a genre of one. Um, so, for example, in Tinker's, it's so interior um, and lent itself to that kind of poetic, impressionistic, associative, it's almost cubist in a way, um, way of moving around. Uh, there's very little dialogue, and um, uh, I didn't put quotation marks. I didn't use quotation marks for this. And I thought, well, I just don't write books with dialogue, and I'm never going to use quotation marks. And then the two protagonists of the novel I'm working on now just spend the entire time chatting. They just yap, 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 yap. And so I use, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not doctrinaire, so I just, you know, I, I, I started using quotation marks, and this novel has a slightly different feel to it. So it's, I mean, from a writer's point of view, it's you don't want to be too doctrinaire or adhere to these theoretical lines being drawn or boundaries because then when the work of art comes to you and it doesn't look like what your preconceived notions are, you can sort of ruin it by trying to get tame it and domesticate it into what are always 
um, you know, your preconceived ideas of what something should look like are always much smaller than the grand sort of work of art that, you know, that, that, that can come across the wire if you're not trying to over-determine it beforehand. And I, I also, when I write, I write what I call interrogatively, which is that I don't know what I'm going to say before I write. And so it's like a divining rod. I just sort of let the, you know, just sort of like, what's the next verb? What's the next noun? And that way, it's sort of an act of, you know, it's a process of revelation. You discover all these wonderful things that you couldn't have known beforehand, before you started writing. That also ideally works well for the reader who comes after you, because then the writing doesn't have the quality of being didactic or just sort of being a dry lecture. It's the moments of revelation are reproduced for the reader to enjoy for herself or himself after you. So that, that, becomes, that, that becomes a much more, to me, kind of... Um, uh, um, um, a, a kind of fellowship, you know. There's, there's a nicer, there's a nicer bond between the writer and the reader. Yeah. Sir. I use paragraphs a lot. Parentheses, yeah. Oh, so who decided the picture on the cover? And I use a lot of parentheses. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, you know, my my favorite. Well, so the, the the picture is easy. They, the, um, the, the, uh, the press just presented me with the cover. Um, luckily, they asked me what I thought of it. Usually, they just give it to you and they say, "Here's your book." But luckily, I found the cover beautiful and I found it austere. And I found that it sort of it 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 looks to me like what I think you f- subsequently find when you read the book. So I I love it. Um, you know, it's appropriately sort of existential looking and all that. Um, and the, um, uh, for the parentheses, I mean, I don't know. I mean, part of it is just, um, it, it's just my personal aesthetic. I like long sentences. I, I, I like, you know, more is more. Some of my favorite writers are Proust, Faulkner. You know what I mean? It's just like page after page after page. And I just, I just, I just like that. I like that density of, I, I, I like feeling like I'm in over my head. I, 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 do, I feel like if I've got the jump on what I'm reading, all I'm doing is confirming what I already know. And I, I really want art to show me stuff that I don't, never expected or never, never thought of. And so I, so I don't mind that. And I don't mind having to reread things. I mean, I, I think something that people don't think about is, you know, it, I think it, I want Tinkers to be a book that people have to and want to reread and that every time they go back they'll find something they didn't see before and that that will be actually a source of delight and not provocation um, because you know you you don't you haven't listened to your favorite piece of music once you listen to it over and over again you haven't watched your favorite movie once you haven't looked at your favorite painting once there are things to which you return over and over again and over and over again they reward your they reward. So then, what was the question? I'm sorry, I do this. But um, so parentheses, yeah. It's, I mean, parentheses are just a way of just sort of having a big sentence just telescope into different different um, modes and different times and all that sort of stuff. And just, I mean, I, I'm just interested in how much a single sentence can hold. I think a single sentence can be a story unto itself, practically. You know, and it's a discipline. It's a it's a it's a very very um, to me satisfying challenge to try to rise to, which is just. Not writing long sentences for the sake of writing long sentences, because all you have to do is just keep writing and, 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 and you, but, but earning, in making your long sentences earn their keep and having them actually be about, be, be, have, a, have an integrity to them. So, yeah. Other? Yeah, sir. Um, no, the, um, the, cl- the clockmaker to whom I apprenticed was my grandfather. His name is Paul Crosby. And he lived on Perkins Street in Wenham for many, many years. And uh, his house was full of clocks. And a- a- as in the book, when my grandfather um, came home for his fa- during his final illness, we, had a, a, we did, the family did have a vigil like the one that's in, that's in Tinker's. Um, and so his house was full of antique clocks that, that, w- that would fall in and out of beat with one another. And it was just a very sort of, um, to, me, to me, it was just a sort of uh, formative, normative, magical place to grow up in. You know? And there was my grandfather sort of presiding over all of it, sort of usually half asleep on the couch, saying, what the hell are you doing? You know, just a very kind of gruff guy sometimes, you know. Yeah. How do you come up with the beginning of the book? I love that with the windows falling in and everything. Uh, the, be- the opening of the book, um, 
is uh, I, it, it's basically, I mean, technically, uh, you know, to put it in the, in the most mundane kind of technical way, it's just an extended metaphor. Um, and so I, when, my, when my grandfather actually was um, sort of beginning to lose consciousness, he did, he did a little, he hallucinated a little bit and he saw cracks. And, and so I just, I, I just thought, well, if you saw cracks in the ceiling and if they worsened, what would happen? So, you know, the, I just imagined, I just took a house and just collapsed it floor by floor by floor and just and just wrote up what I felt like you would see after every logical step and then and then once the house collapsed I just had the clouds and the sky drain and the stars and heaven itself you know and I just extended the metaphor to the end of the universe um, and then that's one of those things where I you know you, you sort of go to the the omega of the thing, the very end of it, you know, it's, it's very almost apocalyptic, it's a personal apocalyptic, a, a personal apocalypse for him. Um, and then when you get to the end of it, um, it's, it, it's, it's, you just, you just put a period and you, you head on. I mean, because it's not, it's, because it's, it's, that's the sort of thing that, I mean, and this, this is one of the things that I, t- I teach writing a lot, you know, and one of the, one of the rules of thumb that I always talk to, talk to my students about is what your job as a writer is, um, is, is to, write as clearly and as lucidly as possible about things that you find truly mysterious in being a human being and in, in, in having this humanity of yours, as opposed to writing obscurely about what proves to be, once, you find, once the reader finds out what your trick is, um, just received opinion and trivia. Um, and so w- what that what that frees the writer to do is, I mean, uh, there are parts and tinkers that, you know, people say, oh, what does this part mean or what does that part mean? And I actually, I can't tell you, I would never presume to, you know, I, I feel like I'm describing these characters' experiences of their own humanity. So the, the book is what I would call experiential in that it really just describes these people's experiences and hopefully the reader in the course of reading these descriptions, recognizes her own or his own humanity in certain ways, um, as opposed to, and this is a very stipulated version of the term, but as opposed to writing psychologically, which is, which is with the motive to explain. I just don't think we can explain away the deepest parts of our humanity to ourselves or to, to each other. And so I wouldn't presume to do that. So when I get to the end of this collapsing universe, I just think, wow, that's... It's just worth, it should, if it works, it's worth reading just in and, in and of itself. It doesn't explain anything or have a point or it doesn't give anybody instructions on how to be a person, you know. It's just sort of, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> and in the Keatsian sense, you know, truth is beauty, beauty, truth. And so it's just, that's what makes it worth reading, you know. Yes, sir. Isn't that a yeah? So that's recognition for you right there. Mm-hmm. Well, bless you, first of all. Thank you. Um, no, I, I. Um, I think one of the reasons why the comparison is made is because she's my mentor. I, I said that to her recently. She said, I was no such thing. But, you know, so she, she doesn't like being a mentor. But she was, and she was for many years before she knew it. But, um, so I think, part of it is, I think part of it is that. I think that, I mean, when I, I, I was lucky in that the very first writing class I ever took, a, a two-week class, three, two or three-week class out at um, Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, um, by the luck of the draw, Marilyn Robinson was my first writing teacher. And it was just an instance of within 10 minutes of her walking into the room and starting to speak and talk about art and philosophy and religion and life, um, I just knew that that's the, uh, that's, I wanted to model my, myself on that quality of mind and that quality of spirit. And meeting her, it was one of those astonishing, and I'm sure everybody's had this experience, but the first time I met her, I felt like it was a reunion. I felt like I was meeting somebody with whom I had been dear friends for a very long time. Um, I think there's, there are sort of um, 
there are sort of aesthetic similarities in that she, I think she and I both are very, very deeply, deeply um, enamored of and engaged with the New England transcendentalist writers. Um, Emerson and Thoreau, and then um, I would include Melville and Hawthorne, Emily Dickinson, even a Wallace Stevens, going back to the poetry. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, Sarah Orne Jewett, writers like that. Um, and for her, that's because she, she, um, she comes out of a congregationalist religious tradition. She's profoundly religious. Um, and so to her, um, it's, it's just one or two degrees of separation from Emerson back to Calvin and Luther. Um, and for me, I, came, I started from a much more secular kind of angle. Um, and then beca- because, of, because I became closer and closer friends with her, started reading the theology and all that sort of... So I think there's just that sort of transcendental humanism that, that, that's there. And I think we also, you know, we write about sort of... Um, uh, we don't write very modern-sounding novels. There aren't many cell phones, and there's not much tweeting and Facebooking <laughs> going on. You know, and part of it is actually that, you know, the, I, I just feel like that that's just a scrim of white noise that's just in the foreground of so many of our lives right now. That, you know, and when you remove that and you quiet everything down and you listen, there's the human soul in, you know, in conference with itself, as it always has been and always will be. And that's just, I'm, 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 in, I'm more interested in that. Also, it's because, you know, I think a lot of, I just, and I don't want to be critical, but, well, I'll be critical. Um, I just feel like, you know, a lot of contemporary literary fiction that I look at, sort of, as much as it supposedly laments, you know, our, our lousy materialist culture and the fact that we have such short attention spans and everything, it, it does so in a way that is that that is so that seems to be superficial. And so, I, all of these books seem to me to end up reproducing the very things that they supposedly lament. So, when I finish these books, I just feel like I've just been abused by the worst of the culture that it's about which it's complaining rather than sort of have, have, have seen something that's a, a thoughtful and artful response to it or antidote to it. And, yeah? Yeah, so the question is just about my process of writing. I mean, it's a pretty vast, vast que- um, subject. Um, one of the things that's interesting, though, is that um, it's been interesting in the process of writing the second book and comparing that experience with writing the first book to see what, um, what, in, the, what in writing the first book was the result of sheer ineptitude and what is actually proving to be something like my style. And it turns out that that vacuum cleaner sort of thing, that's how I actually write. I just wander around and write whatever catches my fancy and just sort of hope that at, the, at, at some point it all just sort of hits critical mass and then I can start moving it around. Being able to move around all the different parts too, I find is, is, very, is, is very pleasurable. It's one of my favorite parts of being a, being a writer because one of the things that arises out of that process is, um, is that when you put different pieces next to each other or in order when they when they when when they when you put them up alongside they 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 strike all sorts of harmonies with one another all sorts of unanticipated over and undertones that you never could have thought up before you actually put them next to each other so it's it even comes down to sort of what is it going to sound like and feel like when the last note struck by the first passage sounds next to the first note of the next pet and you get all these kind of harmonics and you know so it's ersatz music theory again but but it's very it's very um i've been reading a lot of wallace stevens's nonfiction lately and he talks at some point about that the that the that the probings of philosophers are deliberate but the probings of poets are fortuitous and that's what i love that fortuitous aspect of just uh, like just stumbling upon things that you never could have come up with if you were just sort of determining everything. So that's just the process, and it's just, it's just trying to write. Every sentence needs to be concrete. Every sentence needs to be imminent and physical, um, especially with Tinker's, because Tinker's is so interior that um, the whole book was always threatening to just float away and turn into pure ether. So I just sort of made a, made a pact with myself that, you know, if you went through the book, anybody going through the book and just putting their finger down would find a concrete noun or a verb. Um, so I'm just very, very um, interested in imminence, as it were, you know, the physical, the physical world. Did you have a question? Yeah.
high school, a high schooler. Uh, so the question is how I felt about writing in middle school and high school. I guess, again, I, you know, I thought of myself as a writer at least 10 years before I ever wrote anything really that, or that, that I would really consider but I guess I was also sort of scratching away at this and that 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 sort of a thing but it, it mostly came out of a, out of out of being a reader and just the when I first really I, I can remember specifically the first time I explicitly thought to myself I have absolutely got to write I, I can't I can't stay silent anymore and it was in the middle of reading a uh, this you know, great big novel by a Mexican novelist named Carlos Fuentes it was a novel called Terra Nostra um, and I was very, at the time, I was very enamored of the, 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 the group of writers they called the magical realists. Um, um, so Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Julio Cortazar, all these guys. And one of the things I loved about their books is that they always seemed to have the spirit of common endeavor. They always seemed to feel as if any given one of their books was just a chapter in the novel, capital N. And in fact, if you read their books, they often swipe characters from one another. So in the, in the middle of a Carlos Fuentes novel, one of Marquez's characters will sort of walk across the stage, you know, like, well, how did I end up in one of Fuentes' novels? So there's this beautiful idea of kind of common endeavor and fellowship. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that that's basically, you know, that's, that's, that's how I think of, that's how I think of art. And it also goes back to the, you know, the, about the, the connection with Marilyn Robinson too, which is, I think a lot of writers, there's this idea of, um, they call it the anxiety of influence. You know, which is that you're supposed to be anxious about sort of like who, who your who who your um, favorite writers are, and to me, because writing and art is sort of a, an act, a life of fellowship, I'm delighted to wear all of my influences on my sleeve. I'm happy to have all of the. In fact, that that book about the about the Mexican silver mine was the idea I had behind it was it was just going to be just blatant homage to my two favorite novels at the time which were Carlos Fuentes' Terra Nostra and Thomas Mann's novel The Magic Mountain I just was superimposed them and wanted to wanted to write the write that book um, so so yeah and I and I mean I, I think like a lot of writers I'm very, I'm very lazy and I had to trick myself into actually being a writer who wrote um, and part of that was just write, learning to write it sort of a sentence at a time. Just get the sentence down. Just get the sentence down. Um, and, um, and, and, and realizing, too, that I'm not somebody who writes every single day. You know, I go, through, um, I go through periods where maybe from months on end to all appearances, I'm actually just napping on the couch, <laughs> you know, with a book sort of picturesquely tented, on, you know. And my wife will yell from the kitchen, what are you doing? And I'll say, I'm working, you know. <laughs> And now I can say, see, I told you I was working, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Again? Yeah. Yes. This isn't really about the book. It's about the publishing. Are, are you going to have Bellevue publish your new book, number one. Number two, did you hear from any of the people who rejected your book after you got the Pulitzer Prize? <laughs> and number three, were you ever tempted to write to them and say, ha ha, you had your chance? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so um, the fir first question, um, Bellevue Literary Press will not be publishing the next book. Um, uh, the next two books are going to be on Random House. Um, but Ra Random House, uh, I signed with Random House before the Pulitzer, so they don't just love me for my Pulitzer. And... Um, and actually, the, the editor at Random House who bought the second book um, bought it on the basis of reading a partial manuscript, and she hadn't even read Tinker's. So I, I feel pr as, as, as sure as I can be that she just likes the book for itself. Um, no, I never heard from any of the people who sent me rejection letters. Um, and no, I'm not tempted. What's, I have no temptation whatsoever to sort of, um, you know, just say, see, I, got, I mean, they, they know who they are. You know, <laughs> and I could just sort of say, "Look at me now." You know, you missed out. So yeah, no, that's that's not. And you know, I really have to say, I can't. You can't begrudge people that you know these these editors and agents. They have to look at hundreds of manuscripts. They don't have much time to look at them. They do work in a commercial, um, in a commercial realm. And now, even because it's. So much more, you know, because most of the publishing houses are owned by basically like Bertelsmann, this gigantic German corporation that sort of. Um, um, it used to be that an agent, for example, would have to would look at a manuscript and decide whether or not to take it on on, on the basis of whether or not she could convince an editor 
one of the editors she knew that the editor, you know, that, that it would be a viable book. But now an agent has to has to look at a manuscript and and ask herself, can I convince the editor that the editor can convince the marketing department that they could sell ten thousand copies of this thing in hardcover? So it's just it's it's a free for all. So I don't you know I don't hold any grudges. I mean, how can I? It would be churlish of me to um, you know to to do so now. So no, it's yeah. Because my daughter called and said, Mom, I'm taking you out to dinner and then I'm taking you to my favorite author of, in the world. And his, he just wrote Tinkers and it's like reading pure poetry. <laughs> then he used to say, she got sick and here I am. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> well, uh, but terrible. I have one daughter who's an aspiring writer and, and I have another son who is an aspiring guitarist. He wants to work in a rock band. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm thinking, wow. Look, look what Paul Harding did. Maybe they can do it also. So I'm, basically, I wanted to say thank you for giving them the possibility of thinking maybe someday I can, you know, get there. And, 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 and my husband keeps on saying, I think we need a plan B. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you have some advice for them that I can take home tonight. But if, if there's no advice, you know what? You're, you're a great role model. Well, oh, thank for them. you kindly. I, you know what I. I, I I mean, I, I taught the whole time. I, you know, teaching was a viable and honorable profession. And when, and when I thought that I might not, you know, when I sort of had to sit down and have that conversation with myself thinking that you might be a writer who doesn't get published, I really, uh, you know, I, I had to ask myself what were my motives for writing. And they, you know, and, the, and all of my best teachers, you know, they always said, don't ever confuse writing with publishing. Writing is not a predicate of publishing. Writing is not a means. It is the thing itself, you know? And so I figured I already had a wife and children I loved. I already had a roof over my head, and I was gainfully employed for a few years there. And, um, and life was already good. Life was already good, and so I could just keep writing and just, and just do it for my... But, you know, my plan B when I was a rock drummer and that fell through was to become a writer. You know, my, my wife was like, oh, my... Oh, great. You're going to go from being a broke musician to being a broke writer. And so now I used to you know, joke, we used to have the joke is sort of like, well, if the writing thing doesn't work out, I, you know, I think really I, I was meant to be a dancer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you know, but I mean, just in terms of art and, you know, playing, you know, I mean, just do it for its, its own sake and just be dogged, you know, just, just keep doing it, do it a little bit each day and don't, Isaac Dennison used to say, I write a little each day with neither hope nor despair. You know, and you have to kind of, you have to do that. You have to just sort of have that. Because a lot of people I know who, would, who could have been absolutely amazing artists, um, it overwhelmed them. They thought, I'm not doing this 14 hours a day, so, and I didn't start 20 years ago, so there's no hope. And that, it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way, you know, so. That's nice to hear since I write every day. And yeah, there you and go. And I haven't right. published anything. Right. Um, but I'm curious, I was listening to NPR I don't know, maybe it was last month, and they said that some authors now are actually engaging musicians to write soundtrack to their words, and so my question to you is that if you had a soundtrack to Tinkers, what music would be on the soundtrack? Oh, I have, oh that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I like mixed media, but I don't think I'm very good at it. I, I don't know, you know, I can sometimes, I, I, I feel like when I write, I shouldn't listen to music, but I often do. When I do, I listen to Almost, all, it's just it's either Beethoven or Mozart, and it's either their piano, piano sonatas or string quartets. So that's the soundtrack I kind of have in my head for for Tinker. I, but I don't know, you know, the, in, in some ways it might be something more like I don't, you know, some kind of folk music or something, you know, kind of banjos and jugs and washboards and stuff like that. But I don't really know, you know, I, I, I don't really know too much about that. My grandfather was in barber shop quartets, you know. And all that sort of stuff, so there would be, there would be some of that. But I think there's a real art to soundtrack stuff that I, I don't think I'm very good at. But there's, there was some talk of, you know, there's been some talk of a movie, but the, it turns out the problem is, is that since some of the same characters who are in Tinkers are going to be in the next books and it's split between two publishers, um, when, movie, um, when movie folks buy the rights to, um, I guess when they buy rights, they don't buy rights to books, they buy rights to the characters. So there's going, to ha there's going to be some wrangling going on with that at some point. But, so. Anything? Yep. Yeah, he's coming with the microphone. I wanted to know whether that 
powerful description that you read about somebody having an epileptic seizure was based on uh, something that your grandfather was able to describe to you about the feeling of having one, or how did you uh, get into all the, you know, the lightning and all that sort of thing? Yeah, the, um, so it, it, if I, if the character's epilepsy hadn't been another, one of those non-negotiable um, facts that were just presented to me by the material, I never would have written about somebody with epilepsy, um, mostly because I'd just be worried about romanticizing it or sentimentalizing it or treating it as if it was transcendent, as if it was something that sort of... Um, so I took great care to write about it as a personal physical catastrophe, as, a, as, as, as something that gave him no insight. It only baffled him and sort of obliterated him um, because I just, I just didn't want to romanticize it in any way. Um, uh, I also decided that I wouldn't write about it clinically or pathologically. I, didn't, I, I wasn't going to write about it objectively at all. I was going to write about it, again, like I had been describing earlier, I was going to write about it um, experientially and subjectively so that I could just present it as this was his experience of epilepsy without the reader having to consent to, like, that's just the way epilepsy is. And, you know. um, and then just the main metaphor that I, that I used to, to sort of um, discipline the writing about the, about the seizures was just that of being um, electrocuted. And in, in that, in that uh, passage, it was lightning. Um, and, um, and then just throughout the rest of the book, it's just the idea of just an electric current just being turned up too much. You know, I sort of almost think of it like a 25-watt light bulb with the 150,000 watts going through it, and it just, it's just too much. Um, and I, I've, had the, I've had the good fortune of, and, and part of that again came out of also that I was, you know, determined to not do any research, <laughs> which is sort of um, less than admirable in some ways. But also I've had the good fortune of uh, and many people who have epilepsy or other seizure disorders and who have read the book um, have gotten in contact with me after readings or by email and said that, I, that, I've got it, that I got it right. It's, that's what the experience is like. Um, and that, you know, that just makes me sort of feel like go art. You, you, you know that just that that you know the 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 empathetic kind of power of art. So. Is there one more question, maybe? Yeah. I could go on all night, as you could tell. I do in my when I teach. I was curious. You mentioned that you were due to teach about an hour after you read that you'd gotten the Pulitzer, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you did uh, go to that class and what their reaction was. I did, and my students. Bless their hearts, brought champagne. <laughs> yeah, so we just celebrated with a toast. Yep, yep, that was it. And then, and then it's just been um, nonstop since then. I'm, in the, I'm at the end of eight or ten weeks of constant book touring now. I'm going to take a little break for the holidays, and then I'm booked through the middle, through the end of next May. You know, and that's a little bit, you know, so I figure, I, but I figure it's good for Bellevue. I'll be the ambassador. And, and you know, of course, in next April, I'm going to have to give the tiara and the bouquet back when they name the next winner. So, <laughs> so but I'm, I'm game for the full year while I get to be the, the reigning Pulitzer Prize winner. So. so, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was wonderful. That was great. It was a lot of fun. Very interesting. Thank you. Ooh, I'll take this. Well, on behalf of Gordon College and the Library, Paul, we want to thank you for being here and for, for sharing with us this evening. Uh, and Paul has actually graciously agreed to be back in the foyer where there are books for sale, and he will sign. Uh, all of your books, after, of course, he signs mine. <laughs> For those of you that didn't get your book signed, you're welcome. Uh, he's been be very generous with his time this evening and wants to stay to have a chance to meet some of you and sign your book. So thank you for being here this evening, uh, and we'll see you at the sixth Community Reads next year. Thanks. Mm -hmm.